Hi, and welcome to part three of our spring 2019 cruise in the stunning Pacific Northwest. By this point, we've been cruising for almost three weeks, most of it in Desolation Sound. The wind had started to climb, so we rowed back to the boat and cast off for the last few miles to Gorge. And we were due to meet up with five other boats from the Calgary Yacht Club for their annual flotilla. My brother had invited us, and since I had never sailed with them, we were eager to join them on a loop north through Blind Channel. Dale is a competitive small boat racer, mostly Hobie Cats and Martin 16s, and he's also in a wheelchair, and the year before he had discovered the joy of cruising in the Pacific Northwest. By the time we arrived, the wind was really blowing from the south. As we approached the marina, we watched the staff wrestle the cruiser off the fuel dock before we came in to refuel ourselves. The flotilla had reserved spots for us as it was the seafood festival that weekend, and so we knew we had a space. After filling up, we cast off, the dock staff pushing our bow off into the wind, and we switched the fenders to the other side. Slipping into our place in the dock, the wind was strong enough that I had to throw the engine into reverse to maintain a slow enough speed as we approached the dock. It was a nice spot, but the downside was that the wind was pushing waves into our transom and we had to listen to the slap of water just outside our berth all night. A few hours later, Tika arrived, the Kelly Peterson 44 that my brother was aboard, and they snugged in behind us. We visited for a while and met the crew, and soon the rest of our finger filled up as the flotilla slowly drifted in. Rainbow's End, a Du 436, had already been a dock when we arrived. Time Warp, a Catalina 32, cruised in and rafted to them. Then Norfin, a Genot 49 from the Desolation Sound Yacht Charter, showed up. And last in was Gloman's Magic, another Genot from Desolation Sound Yacht Charters, this time a 42 Dexalon. We offloaded Dale into his wheelchair and rolled him up the ramp and then up the hill to the Sea Fest. There was live music, a beer tent, and some great seafood on offer. Leslie and I had decided to forego the seafood in favor of me doing some laundry and her finishing off the last of her work for the trip. I poked around Gorge Harbor for a while, picked up some fresh produce, and later joined some of the flotilla members for a drink. It was a great day that ended with live music on the patio, and we had front row seats from the deck of our boat. The next day, most of the flotilla took off early while we dawdled at the dock. Then we transited back through Uganda Passage, headed up Sudal towards Surge Narrows, where we caught up with the rest of the flotilla circling around, waiting for slack in Beasley Passing. It was a gorgeous day and we spent most of it on the bow, using the autopilot remote to steer the boat towards our final destination, the Octopus Islands.
few hours of smooth motoring later, we stern tied in the central cove at Octopus Islands and watched as the rest of the fleet came in. The water was pretty shallow, but I failed to get any good video of it. All tied up, most of the rest of the boats opted to head off for a hike, except for Tracy off Fatika, who was a bit of a rower. We decided to just relax in the sunshine, read, and catch up on the log. Later I went for a row and enjoyed the beauty of Octopus, another one of our favorite anchorages. And took some pictures of the symmetry of the boats all lined up in a row. To catch slack the next morning, we either had to hit the 6 a.m. turn to ebb or the noon turn to flood. Everyone but us and Norfin decided to get up early and ride the ebb. The weather was still beautiful as I crawled into the cockpit in a now empty cove, but you could see the clouds were rolling in. Leslie was suffering from a bit of lie bed, but eventually woke up to some fresh tea and a grey, rainy day. The batteries were looking good with all that motoring, but we hoped to do some sailing on our way to Blind Channel. Around 11.30, we were circling outside of Upper Rapids, waiting for slack. And eventually decided to head through about 11.45, 15 minutes before turn. Except for the lack of visibility due to constant drizzle, it was a pretty standard no drama transit. With Norfin following, we headed up Discovery Passage and then on to Johnstone Strait. Despite the forecast of wind, we managed to roll out the head sail for about five minutes before it died altogether and ended up motoring the whole way. Blind Channel was as pretty as always. Once we tied up, we went for a short walk, visited Dale Labortica, and generally enjoyed the atmosphere. That's a good idea. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll schedule it in between my holiday for my holiday, yeah. It was opening night at the restaurant and a bunch of the flotilla decided to try it, but we opted to eat aboard. The next morning, the current outside Blind Channel was running at five knots, and we all decided to let it slack off a bit before heading south to Big Bay. This meant we would be catching the evening slack at Dent. Impatient, a few hours later we were the first off the dock, motoring into the three or four knot current. There was still no wind, so we motored most of the way to Shoal Bay. The boats who left later managed to find a bit of wind, and all had a nice sail to our afternoon stopping spot. It started out wet and cloudy, but the weather got better and better as the afternoon progressed. Anchoring in Shoal Bay was a bit of an adventure. The water shallows quickly, so you drop your anchor in 30 feet, and your stern is soon settling into less than four. We 
tried four or five drops until finally we were happy with our anchor in about 30 feet of water and our stern in about six. But it was a rising tide and we weren't worried. Eventually, the rest of the boats slowly came into view and we watched them tack back and forth in the channel until they headed into the bay. Rainbows end and time warp snag spots at the public wharf. Tika rafted up to us and the other two dropped anchor in slightly deeper water. Leslie and Jean from Tika, who was an amateur bird watcher, went for a row to try and spot some swallows while the rest of us basked in the warm sun. When she got back, we opted to row to the wharf and walk up to the pub. The crews of Rainbow's End and Time Warp were engaged in some serious horseshoes, and the hummingbirds were all out in full force. Eventually, it was time to cast off with a few short miles to Dent Rapids. As Larry, the owner of Tika and I, emerged from a tour of his boat, I noticed that we seemed to have moved. Tika cast off, and as I regained the cockpit, a quick glance at the depth meter showed we were now in 80 feet of water. Sometime in the last few minutes, the anchor had broken loose, and we'd been drifting out to sea. No harm done, but it was an interesting moment. We had a lovely four-sail only sail down to Dent, arriving almost exactly on time. Fired up the engine, negotiated the first two rapids, Dent and Gillard, and then headed across the bay to the public docks, our destination for the night. Tika tied up across from us, and the planned Appy Night gathering commenced as soon as everyone was settled. I had some fresh baked boule and focaccia that I'd made while we were underway, so fresh bread was our contribution to the festivities. The sun slowly set, and that was the end of a lovely day. The next morning was the start of the first parade. Apparently they call them parades because the word race scares the charter companies. Slack at the Yakultas wasn't until one, so we potted around the dock for a while before casting off. The wharf was under construction, so if you wanted to get to shore, you would have had to take the dinghy. The parade started at 2, right at the start of Calm Channel, and was scheduled to run all the way to Toba Inlet. The winds were super calm, but everyone was convinced they would pick up. Tika and Time Work lingered on the start line, trying to get their spinnakers up, while the rest of us floated off. It was calm and lovely and slow. The wily Rainbow's End caught some outflow from a nearby channel and took off like a shot. Then, one by one, we all found the same wind and had a nice sail for all of 20 minutes. Just at the entrance to Razor Passage, the wind died, and there we all collected, barely moving forward, until it was decided to call the race 
It was getting late and we still had a few miles to go. Originally, we had intended to spend the night on the docks at the Toba Inlet Wilderness, but we had been informed the night previously that they weren't ready for us, or for anyone for that matter, and we had decided to head for Walsh Cove instead. As we headed down Price Channel, the wind came up a bit and we raised the jibs for just that last little bit, and then we turned south towards Waddington. At Walsh Cove, Rainbow's End, Time Warp, and Gloaming Magic rafted up. I think there was a poker game that needed to be finished. Well, we tucked in close to the shore, about 15 feet, and Tika and Norfin settled in just off our bow. The next morning, Leslie and I went for a row. We wanted to check out the petroglyphs, which were supposed to be on a cliff just around the corner. Then we rode around, stared at the oyster catchers, peered into the clear waters, and generally enjoyed a beautiful morning. Tracy broke out her skull, and it looked like she was attempting to reach our next destination before anyone even raised anchor. Eventually, we all cast off our stern lines and set out for an afternoon swim in Pendrel Sound. We motored about halfway down Waddington, and then we found the wind. Then there ensued one of the best sails of the trip as we tacked back and forth. We almost made it all the way up Pendrel before losing the wind again. The head of Pendle Sound has some of the warmest waters in BC because the north and south tides around Vancouver Island meet there, and as a result the water doesn't change much, allowing it to retain its heat. We all splashed around for an hour or so until it was time to head out. The next destination was Grace Harbor. As we headed into Desolation Sound proper, the winds whipped up and we were just about to raise our sails when Time Warp up in front of us was whipped around by a huge gust. So we chickened out and motored the short distance to Grace. We all tucked in fairly close to one another up on the north side. The next morning we realized that perhaps we had tucked in just a little too close, as Gloman Magic's anchor brought up Rainbow End's chain. But a quick flip of the chain and all was well. We were supposed to be racing again that day, so we tidied up a bit and then set off for the race start, just off Sarah Point. The winds were up again, so most of us started with a few reefs in, but they quickly died. I tried a different strategy, heading off on a long jive, but in the end I couldn't catch anyone. And those of us without a spinnaker were soon left behind.
The fantastic Warfinger at Lund managed to squeeze us all in, and we had a lovely dinner up at the hotel before enjoying a pleasant sunset walk. The next morning it was goodbye to everyone as they were all going their own way. The two charter boats were headed back to Comox along with Tika, and Time Warp and Rainbow's End needed to get back south pretty quick to drop off some crew. We had a nice short award ceremony awarding Tika the grand honours, and then we were off. We sailed in company with Time Warp for a while, watching them slowly gain and then pass us with their bright yellow spinnaker. Then we tacked back around Harwood to go down Malaspina while they headed on down the strait to the other side of Laschetti. We had a great sail until the wind eventually died, and we motored the last little bit until we arrived at Smuggler Cove. After we were anchored, we relaxed and basked in the glory of our lovely tin of oysters, our prize for third place in our three-boat division. Well, that's pretty much it for part three. Stay tuned for our fourth and final episode as we head back towards Nanaimo.